Well, good morning, saints, whether you're joining us across the internet or here in person. I'm glad to see you. And uh, actually, I, re I really am very glad to see you. It's, it's been a, a challenging month. And I, I, before we get started with the worship, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your prayers for me personally and for my family as we've been uh, fighting COVID and uh, on the road to recovery there. So um, I'm back and very, very thankful for the Lord's healing and health. Um, to kind of set our hearts this morning, we've got a little scripture that I want to focus in from Psalm chapter 28. And, and this says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him, my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts, I mean, my heart rejoices. And with my song, I give thanks to him. And that's what we want to do this morning. So if you're outside on the patio or in here or out on the internet, I just want to invite you to stand. Let's enjoy the presence of the Lord and and with our song, let's give our thanks to him. As it says elsewhere in scripture, we are to uh, invited to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So let's do that this morning as we seek him and give glory to him.
Psalm, uh, not Psalm, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. By the way, this is like a really, really good chapter. If you have never read through Isaiah 43, I highly commend it to you. It's got so much encouragement from the Lord. And in it, in chapter 43, in, in verse 19, he, God says, Behold, I am doing a new thing, and now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And it's just such a strong reminder to us that even when stuff might not be going our way, when we might be like not feeling it, that God is still here. God is still at work. God is doing stuff in us, around us, through us, sometimes in spite of us. And, uh, and we just want to get in behind what the Spirit of God is doing and be sensitive to his presence this morning. So as we sing this song, it's kind of born out of that heart of really wanting to recognize God is making a way and he is here. Promise keep 
Jesus, the Savior, Redeemer, the lover of our souls, the friend who sticks closer than a brother, the one who hears us in our distress, who binds up our wounds, who draws near to the brokenhearted, our provider. Thank you, Lord. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when Praise the Lord. 
my sacrifice of praise. Lay it down for you. I will lay my life down. Cause you laid your life down for me. I will lay my life down. Throw down my crowns. It's my sacrifice of praise. I will lay my life down. Throw down my crowns, it's my sacrifice free.
Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We ask, Lord, that through the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would move freely in this room and for all those watching online, just straight through the interwebs and minister to our hearts today. You know what we need. You know the cares and the concerns that we brought into this place or whatever situation we're in right now, we need your comfort and your truth. We thank you that you are the God of all comfort. And as we sing these songs, Lord, we want them to be anthems of our heart, that our hearts would be close to you, not like the scripture says, just honoring God with our lips, but our hearts far from you. We want our hearts to be close to you. And we pray that you would minister to each one of us, Lord, as we continue in worship and looking at your word, that we would see your truth and hear your heart and you understand your love for us. So God, we don't want to take this moment for granted. We don't want to just go through the motions. We don't want to play church or even sit through another sermon we want our hearts close changed because you say that if we seek you with all our heart we'll find you and so we thank you that you're not hiding from us and that in times past you spoke to us through the prophets or you spoke through the prophets but now you speak to us through your son Jesus Christ so magnify Jesus we want to lift up Jesus here in this place And when Jesus is lifted up, he'll draw all people, draw you and your heart close to him. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, amen, amen. All right. Well, good morning, church. Good to see everyone here today. I want to welcome you guys to Quest Church. If we haven't met, my name is Sherwood part of the ministry team here. I want to welcome all those watching online. Please give us a thumbs up, a fist bump emoji, whatever it is. Say hi uh, in the comments down below. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know prayer requests that you might have because that's uh, what we're all about here. In fact, if uh, you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to grab them and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you a Bible. We do want you to be able to follow along with us, and uh, as we continue our study through the book of Matthew, we find ourselves picking up that story in chapter 5, looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's a very famous portion of Scripture. In fact, it's the most famous sermon ever preached, and as the book of John tells us in the closing, it says, if there were to be books written about all that Jesus said and did, We just couldn't make as many books or print as many books as there would need to be. And so I guess you could spend 30 years on the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to spend three weeks. (laughs) Uh, But that doesn't mean that your heart needs to jump in and out of these verses. Just let these scriptures soothe and marinate and uh, soften and minister to your heart as we read them. But uh, we are seeing... Here in these verses, really, Jesus' identification of a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And I think it's important for us to consider and understand and be reminded of how different a disciple or a follower of Jesus looks from the world. And uh, when we see how this character is defined by Jesus, as well as the conduct of a disciple and the consistency of a disciple in living in uh, consistency with uh, what one believes and uh, as, as well as how one lives their life. 
And so picking up the story in verse 1, we see uh, this, and seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, first off, let me just say a few things of this introduction. One is, whenever Jesus opens his mouth, just shut up. <laughs> I, maybe that's kind of a harsh way of saying it. I probably, I usually tell my kids I don't like you saying those words, so maybe I should take that back, but um, just be quiet. Okay, say a little nicer that way. Um, be quiet. If Jesus is speaking, listen. Tune in. And uh, Jesus is speaking through these chapters. Uh, as maybe in your Bibles, there are red letters. And whenever you see red letters in the Bibles, uh, the printers did that specifically so we would know that these were the recorded words of Christ. And so we want to pay attention. But uh, look who is coming to hear Jesus' words, and that is the disciples. And so the disciples follow where Jesus goes. That's a good rule, just very simple rule of thumb. Wherever Jesus goes, whatever Jesus says, you go and you listen. And that might be up on a mountaintop. For example, here, we know that Jesus often withdrew to places to pour into and to invest in his disciples. Now, we also know that just based on the previous few verses of chapter 4, that there was a great revival happening. There was um, a great ministry and work being done. But that came after Jesus was led and filled by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And uh, so we can be assured that as followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And if we are led, the Scripture says, those that are led by the Spirit of God, these shall be called the children of God. And so the Holy Spirit's not going to drive you. He's not going to whip you. He's not going to force you. He's going to lead you. And as the Holy Spirit leads you, we walk in step with the Spirit. And as we walk in step with Him, sometimes He's going to lead you into places that are challenging, that are difficult, and that are painful. But He's doing that to develop your character. And He's more concerned about your character than He is about any sort of activity that you do for Him. And really what we see in the Beatitudes, as well as the Sermon on the Mount, is that the heart of the matter for Jesus is the matter of the heart. It's getting a hold of the heart and transforming and changing the heart. So just as Jesus says, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, but what comes out. And so yesterday at our men's breakfast, we were talking about the tongue and about our words and how they have an effect in people's lives, whether to build up, that there is death and life in the power of the tongue. And for us to uh, consider the, the heart that what comes out of a person is really what defiles them. And it's a, it's a reflection of their heart. So if you want to know what's going on in a person's heart, then you listen to their words. And you understand while there's pain there, or there's hurt, or there's anger, or whatever it is. And so Jesus here, as he is ministering to the multitudes. There's, he's, um, he's preaching. He's uh, healing. And there's many people coming. Now, when you do a little search through the Gospels, you see that there's many multitudes of people. And there's different groups and categories of people who were following Jesus. One was the multitudes, as mentioned here. And uh, that's uh, thousands uh, of people who, for the most part, were just kind of interested in what Jesus had to bring. Uh, he was different. And there was something new and exciting about this man. And so they followed Jesus out of what they could get out of him for personal gain. Well, you just, you know, heal me and off I go on my own life. But we also know that there was, um, there was uh, disciples. Now we know that there were 70 disciples and those 70 were empowered by Jesus and sent out to minister on behalf of him in various towns. But we also know there was 120 disciples after Jesus ascended up into heaven and they tarried and waited for the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. So this smaller group than the multitudes were those who were following Jesus. They left their comfortability and um, were students and pupils and disciples of Jesus. But we also know that there were the apostles and the twelve and this smaller group of men who Jesus called by name and empowered them to carry the mantle of ministry and leadership. And then even within that, we see Peter, James, and John, just three, who were invited into a very small little circle of ministry with Jesus and raising the boy from the dead and seeing Jesus transfigured on the mountain. And so uh, 
I'm fascinated by why people are seeking Jesus and why people are around Jesus. And whenever you see Jesus look at the multitudes, he has compassion on them. And that's the heart of Jesus, and I think that's the, really the heart of a disciple, is when you look out upon people, you see their need and their hurt and their brokenness. In fact, that's what Jesus said he's come to do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me in Luke chapter 4, to heal the brokenhearted and to set at liberty those who are held captive. And so Jesus looks at the multitude and he sees that they are like a sheep without a shepherd and they're, they're lost. But he also sees within the multitude and the masses, he sees the individual. And let that be an encouragement to you, even though we might be in a, a crowded group here or wherever else you might be in a group of people, you might feel very alone. Just remember that Jesus sees you in the crowd. He sees you and knows you by name. He understands the issues and the concerns of your heart because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And when he looks out and calls his disciples, they come to him. The best place is to just go to Jesus, to seek him, to hear his voice as he teaches and explains this character of what a true disciple really is. And it, it's contrary to maybe some of the qualities that you were brought up with to be self-reliant and independent and strong. Now, I'm not saying that those qualities aren't negative or bad, but these qualities that Jesus describes here in the Beatitudes are those that portray the character of a disciple. So we're going to see the attitudes that Jesus defines in the Beatitudes, but we're also going to see the attraction that a, a disciple's life will have in drawing people to the Lord or in being repulsive against the Lord in pushing people away from the Lord. And then lastly, we're going to see the actions that the heart attitude and the character develop in us so that we can glorify God and draw people to Him. So that introduction there is as he begins to speak and then says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everyone say blessed. Blessed. So each of these characteristics are, uh, are presented with this word blessed and blessing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Everyone say peacemaker. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Of God. These are traditionally what we call the be attitudes, the attitudes that define the life of a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. There are many qualities here, but described here with this word blessed really means, oh, how happy, uh, oh, how satisfied, oh, how content. It's similar to the word being used in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Uh, he or she will be like a tree planted by streams of water, whose leaf does not wither, and whatsoever they do shall prosper. And so this blessing of happiness uh, and joy and contentment comes, I mean, you consider some of these qualities and they don't seem all that joyful. They don't seem all that pleasant. But Jesus is speaking to a spiritual condition of the soul and of the heart. You see, when we have a mourning in our lives, though blessed are those who mourn, well, we can all identify with that. We all grieve. In fact, this word means to have intense grief and pain and anguish. Now, I think the English translation here is a bit limited in our understanding of Jesus' depth of what he's teaching the disciples. Yes, there is comfort in pain, but the mourning here that Jesus speaks of is a deep conviction of sin as it, and its consequences in the spiritual bankruptcy that it has in our lives. And when we have that deep conviction of sin, what it produces is a greater comfort from God. And as 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us that God is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our sorrows and troubles. Now, we may be, uh, feel sorry about our sin, but when it grieves us, it causes us to come to a place where the Lord comforts and changes. And not only that, but it produces change in our lives. 
And we're hungering and thirsting now for righteousness. This is a craving, an intense craving. And those who crave purity will be satisfied completely. And that, I believe, is at the heart of Jesus' concern for every single one of us, is that our lives would reflect more the life and the characteristic and the Christ-likeness of Jesus. And, uh, you know, those things that do not, there's uh, room for repentance and there's room for change and there's room for correction. And I think that now, more than ever, is a time to ensure that the things that are inside the circle of our life are in line with the uh, pages of Scripture and the holiness of God. And so maybe uh, just mentally kind of draw a circle right now around your life, your work, your relationships, uh, your routines, and your schedule. Draw a circle around that and include your heart as well, your private life as well as your public life. And anything that is within that barrier and that circle that does not honor the Lord Jesus Christ, that does not bring praise to Him, uh, eliminate it and remove it and just cut it out. In fact, Jesus is going to go on to say in these verses in chapter 5 that if there is any compromise to take radical measures in cutting it off and in casting it out. And so he says that there is purity and holiness. And we sang some of that today, that God is holy and he wants to use a holy vessel for his purpose. And what happens is, is that when we are holy, there is a satisfaction in him and in him alone. Blessed are the pure in heart. This idea is being undefiled. And when we have a holy devotion to God, it brings a heightened intimacy with him. For they shall see God. The Bible says no one's seen God. And yet we'll be able to see him when we're pure in heart. And when the Lord changes that purity in our lives and there's meekness and there's um, mercy and uh, the humility that comes with acknowledging our need for him as well as the mercy. Uh, you know, when we give mercy, we are the ones that are in most need of mercy. And so we give that to one another as a disciple being changed. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers. You know, God is the God of peace. He is the great, he's the prince of, Jesus says, the scripture says of Jesus that he's the prince of peace. And when you pursue the God of peace, you will practice the gift of peace. When you seek the one who is peace, you see Jesus made peace for us. When we were at enmity and, and uh, shaking our fist in rebellion against God, Jesus is the one who stepped in and was our peace offering to ensure that we now can have peace with God. And we can come into his presence to obtain mercy and help in time of need. You see, it's the devil who's the troublemaker, but it's the disciples who should be the peacemakers. And the challenge that we have right now is that uh, there is so much division and so much anger and so much strife in our culture, in our world, say on social media, in the rhetoric that is going on, that the only thing that's going to cut through that is a person who is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not under the influence of other things that we're hungering and thirsting for. And when we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then we bring the sense of peace and of truth and of life into the situation. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs, they shall be called sons and daughters of God. And so he describes this quality and this characteristic that is unique to the disciple. And he deals with the heart, portraying the character of one who professes and claims to be a disciple. And then he goes on to say that there's a, a unique uh, attribute uh, here, and that is in salt and in light. Look at verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing. I think this is one of the most tragic little phrases in Scripture. We might just brush over it pretty quickly. I don't know if anyone ever told you that before. You're good for nothing. That's kind of sad. You don't want to say that to a child. It can really hurt them and damage them for a long time. Good for nothing. But Jesus here is relating the influence that we can have in the world for Christ and having a light 
um, for others to see, as well as a flavor of Christ's likeness in our lives. And he says that it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and hide it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Secondly, really what we see is that a disciple's life distinctly attracts other people to God. I think I mentioned this earlier. Maybe sometimes I know for myself, my life, my words, my actions or reactions do not reflect well on the Lord Jesus Christ because I'm acting out of the flesh or I'm acting out of my own personal interest and gain probably because there's pride and and arrogance inside. Uh, Yesterday again at the men's breakfast, we were talking about how our tongue can be very difficult to tame. And um, there's consequences to that. And somebody mentioned about Moses, and it really struck me. I didn't even think about this, how uh, Moses was the most humble person on the face of the planet. And uh, you have to be humble to pastor two two million people. I mean, come on, goodness. Cut this guy a break, right? Um, And not only two million people, but two million grumbling, complaining, and selfish people. So, I mean... Wow, that pastor needed a lot of prayer. Uh, But as he's ministering to them, he's humble. But yet, it got to him. And at one point, in one moment, out of anger, he misrepresented the Lord Jesus Christ and God before the people. And because of that, he was not allowed to go into the promised land. I thought, man, that's really harsh. But God takes very seriously the the influence and... um, the representation that we have towards other people. And I have seen, unfortunately, uh, what some people profess to be followers of Jesus Christ say and act completely contrary uh, online. You know, and it's sad. It's very sad. It's, it very, actually breaks my heart. And uh, one of the, um, probably the most common comments that, Someone will say to me after uh, preaching or speaking, and uh, they'll come up to me and say, well, that was a really great reminder. And I think, well, that's, that's wonderful. That's good. I think that's a, it's an indication that uh, God is working in their heart, and they're open to how the Lord's speaking to them. And, uh, but uh, reminders we can have all the time, but how is that affecting our lives? So a reminder on Sunday shouldn't be just thrown out on Monday It should continue into a changed life and a changed heart in being salt and light and peacemakers. And, uh, you know, Jesus talks about salt. I mean, salt is valuable, it's useful, and it's flavorful. And in the same way, disciples penetrate their culture and their world and their relationships with a preserving influence. Now, what kind of influence, I guess, we need to ask ourselves that we have? What kind of influence do we have uh, for and on other people? And he says that if, if salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing. Now, the way that salt loses its flavor is by other elements and impurities mixing in with the pure elements of salt. And disciples, followers of Jesus, contaminate their effectiveness for God with polluted impurities. And I have found that Minor compromises over time create major catastrophes in my life. When I have these small little compromises in pollution that I allow into my life, I don't want to hear the Lord say, you're good for nothing because you have such dirtiness in your life. Um, You might be able to fool, we might be able to fool people for a while, on the outside, and even think like, wow, I can get away from this and be used by God even though I have these things that I'm hiding in my life, but God sees. And when he says, I want you to be pure, pure in heart, and not compromised or contaminated in the uh, impurities, and there is nothing more dreadful than a distasteful Christian. There's nothing more yucky. In fact, Jesus in um, Revelation talks about how you're neither hot nor you're neither cold. And because of that, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And maybe you've had something that's either too salty 
or not salty enough and you just wanted to spit it out of your mouth because it didn't taste right. And that's the way it is for an unsavory Christian. Listen, we live in a world that is bitter and sour and we need now more than ever men and women who are pure in heart that have the flavor of Christ Jesus, who bring in peace, who have the comfort of God, who are shining light for Him, who are illuminating their world with an impact that is drawing people to the Lord, not away. He says that uh, we should let our works shine before people. Now, when you talk about works, I guess we need to understand that we're not talking about works into salvation because the Bible is very clear that it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. So it's very clear that faith alone saves, but faith that saves is not alone. It's accompanied by a changed life. And when that life is changed, then we begin to see, like in Ephesians, those good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we attract with the flavor of Christ in our lives people to the Lord, not to ourselves. Or not to push people away and say, man, I, that, I don't want that. I don't want that God. No, I want the God of comfort and the God of peace and the God of grace to forgive and to walk with me because he says, don't hide it. You see, Jesus uh, never intended to build a secret society of Christians. He wanted to disperse and to scatter his light bearers and those salt sprinklers and shake us all over to impact and influence and draw people to the Lord. And as we see here, that's a challenge for us because we have competing um, issues in our heart. One is the spirit and the other is the flesh. And Paul the Apostle said that I do the things that I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I want to do. And this struggle is so very difficult and hard. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than our hearts. And as we see here in verse 21, Jesus says and warns us about just going through the motions of tradition and religion or of a, even of legalism and getting down to the heart of the issue. He says, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And then jump down to verse 27. You have heard, again, he says it in the same way, that it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. And then he goes on to talk about how if there's friction or division with another person, that as you're seeking and worshiping the Lord, that you should first go and be reconciled in your relationship to this other person. You see, God is a God of reconciliation. Through the peace offering of Jesus Christ, he has made reconciliation with us who were en enemies of God. So we have a vertical relationship with God that is intact, but we also have a horizontal relationship with other people. And when those horizontal relationships are off, then it affects our vertical relationship with God and vice versa. So much so that God doesn't even want you to... He wants you to take care of business with other people and be reconciled and have a humbleness of heart to quickly resolve those interactions and relationships. And so thirdly, really, we see here is that our hearts determine the actions that we take. And um, Jesus says, you've heard that it has been said. And this really deals with tradition and ultimately the hypocrisy of the religious establishment who were saying one thing but living something completely different. You see, obeying God's word differs from superficial positions or external performance. And that's what the law for these religious people was all about. Well, what are my traditions and what are my beliefs that are not rooted in the truth and the word of God? And how am I performing those externally for other people to see? You have heard that it was said, well, listen, don't believe everything you say. Just because a leader says it doesn't make it true. And just because it's been around for a while doesn't make it true either. And Jesus says, but I say to you, 
He brings it down below the surface of external performance because Jesus didn't come to regulate behavior but renovate believers, to renovate your heart, to change it from the inside out so that our actions then begin to uh, conform and look like uh, the works, the good works of Jesus Christ drawing people back to ourselves. And ultimately, that's really how we're going to reach this world and this culture as salt and as light because we will never greatly impact our world for Jesus by gradually imitating it. That's why you are to be distinct and look different. You talk different. You act different. You walk different. You live different. And that difference is what makes you stand out. And as you stand out, then you bring people to Jesus. And so there's this tradition that he's breaking all these cultural, religious norms and saying it's a matter of your heart. And your heart is going to pull you in one of two directions. And he explains the the truth and the reality of obeying, of hearing God's word. Breaking God's word deals with an internal heart condition. You see, this heart condition is at the root of obeying and and following Jesus. So in the heart is where we make those choices. And the solution really, as Jesus says here, is to take drastic measures, right? He goes on to talk about how if if, uh, your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it away from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now what's Jesus talking about? He's not endorsing self-mutilation. He's using hyperbole. It's an exaggerated statement to emphasize an important principle or point. And that point is, to take drastic measures in eliminating and removing uh, the sin that is keeping you from looking and tasting and being like Jesus. To cut those things off and out of our lives. And the practical implication of this, the actions that we take in applying God's Word takes those drastic intentional practices. Because um, if we are ignorant of God's truths, then um, our obedience is not following. And so when we understand God's word, then there's obedience and trusting and believing him. And so this is really the, uh, the opening and the entrance of Jesus radically turning upside down what it looks like and what it means to be a follower and a disciple of his. How do you identify what a Christian look li- looks like? It's different than what the world looks like. The attitudes portray a heart that is pure and undefiled, one that is bringing peace into situations, that is blessed in hungering and thirsting for righteousness, comforted by the mercy and the grace of God, that begins to look now in the changed life in the heart and is useful to the Lord Jesus Christ in how they attract people to him and bring him glory and, uh, and him praise. And ultimately, uh, coming to a place of saying, this is the one I follow. And as I follow him, then you can also be changed because of what he's done. Now, what do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Just a few takeaways as we go into this week. One is an encouragement, a challenge. I think um, Jesus definitely offers us... Um, comfort, but he also off, offers us conviction. And uh, a lot of times that conviction brings about a change in our lives. One is to eliminate any impurities that are spoiling your Christ-like flavor for him. And be very intentional and very serious about uh, removing those things that are inside the circle of your heart and inside the circle of your life that are impure. Secondly, ensure that our actions point people to Jesus, not to make them gag at Jesus, but to point them to Jesus. And then thirdly, 
as our worship team comes on up and we close in this song and consider how the Lord's speaking to us. Evaluate everything you hear through the word of God. You have heard many things, but I say to you, Jesus says, I say to you. And when we hear Jesus open his mouth and teach these words, he'll go on to say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, those who hear my words and do them will be like a person who builds their lives and their, their, their house and their life upon the rock. They'll be able to stand. And I know that's important right now because we're only 10 days into 2021 and we're already wishing this year was over. It's crazy. And we thought we, thought we endured enough in 2020. And uh, we were driving home the other day, coming back from worship practice, picking up my daughter, and uh, we couldn't help but see the sky behind us. We live out in Hopatool Valley as we're driving east up the 8 freeway, getting higher and higher in elevation. We couldn't help but see just this light display behind us. It was just lit up, beautiful, bright, clear, just uh, pink and reds and all these. And uh, it was, you know, when everything that you would read or see online is just imploding. And you almost feel like, even though you're just holding on to Jesus, you almost feel like, man, I, what do I do? It's just, it's really crazy. And, and the portrait that Jesus uh, painted in the sky, it soothed my heart. And my daughter said, um, you know, God really likes pink because he uses it a lot. And I thought, you know, can I just keep it simple like that? I just need to be simple here. Sure would calm your heart down and remember every single day that the sun comes up, that's a reminder of God's faithfulness. And every single day that that sun goes down, it's a reminder that God is in control. That he's got things taken care of. But now more than ever is, is the time to be ready. Jesus is returning. I don't know if you discern the times, but he's coming back. And I don't want to be a good for nothing when Jesus comes back. I want to be useful to the Lord. And uh, I don't want anything in my life. I don't want to be doing anything that is going to bring shame to the one who I claim to be my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the most important thing is right now is to be right with Him. Because before we sing this song or finish this song, He's going to come back. And I would be like, yes. That's awesome. Come on back. We're ready for you. Are you ready for him? Be ready in your heart. Close to him. Seek him. So let's sing this song and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we know that you love us. And I pray for all of these precious people hearing this message this morning. As you open your mouth and teach us the way of a disciple. This is the way. I've been watching The Mandalorian. And they are, they're very honorable people. And they say, when they finish their whatever their duty is, this is the way. And Jesus is showing us the way. This is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as we sing this song, I encourage you to cast those burdens and those cares upon Jesus. To not leave this place carrying those weights anymore. And maybe if you've never gone up to the mountain or surrendered your life as a disciple of Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. To follow his leading and his way. To repent of your sins and turn to him to receive forgiveness of sins and the rescuer and savior of your soul. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Save your soul. So God, we love you. Praise you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's all stand as we sing this song. And as always, if you need prayer, encouragement, 
support of any kind afterwards. I'm available. Our team is available to pray with you. And I know we mention this each time, but I know that I get messages and calls, which is wonderful. Please keep them coming. I'll take more messages and calls throughout the week. Hey, can you pray for me? I'm hurting. I need this. We can do that today together as well. Um, But don't let this moment pass without spending that quiet moment with Jesus up on the mountain. Let's sing.
attention to you and our response to you to not just be lip service. I pray that you would help us to treasure up the things that you have spoken to us today through your word, through Pastor Sherwood, maybe through the conversations we are going to continue to have this afternoon. Help us to ponder them, help us to respond and walk lives that do attract others to you that point others to you, that showcase your glory. Thank you for inviting us to the work that you are doing. Please help us to remember it's your work, and we are privileged to be a part of it. We are so grateful to belong to you, Jesus. It's in this, your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful day. If you've been tuning in online, I invite you to share any prayer requests you may have, maybe some praise reports, what God's been doing in your life. Feel free to send us a private message if you don't feel comfortable just posting it there, but we're glad you've joined us. God bless you. We'll see you again soon.